So the way that our growth hormone secretagogues work is that it helps, it creates a signal to the pituitary gland to secrete more of your own growth hormone. All right, let's go into the growth hormone secretagogues. These here, this was my, my first peptide love, okay? The growth hormone secretagogues. Um, I first came across these in an underground forum even before med school happened because I personally had a low back injury from a car accident that I could not heal. And so, um, you know, at two in the morning when you're searching the internet, you find the underground forums, right? You kind of go deep. So this has probably started circa 2012 for me. So the way that our growth hormone secretagogues work is that it helps, it creates a signal to the pituitary gland to secrete more of your own growth hormone, okay? There are two categories of these growth hormone secretagogues. There are the growth hormone releasing hormones. These are up here on our left, the GHRH. They are going to stimulate the GHRH receptor. Great name for it. The other class is the GHRPs, which are the growth hormone releasing peptides, okay? Those are going to stimulate the growth hormone secretagogue receptor, which is actually the same receptor that ghrelin stimulates, okay? So ghrelin's that signal that comes from your gut up to your brain to tell you you're hungry. When that happens, you're actually getting a pulse of growth hormone as well. The reason for that is because one of growth hormone's roles is to break down fat and move fat into the blood for you to have energy, right? And so if you're hungry and you need some energy, Growth hormone tries to come in and save the day without you having to rely on uh, cortisol and adrenaline, okay? Now, the really interesting thing is that we have this little pathway here. This SRIF is basically the fancy name for somatostatin, okay? Somatostatin stops the release of growth hormone, which is really, really important, okay? Because the way that growth hormone is natu naturally released in the body is in pulsatile spikes, okay? So you'll have very, very low growth hormone. In men, it's actually like undetectable in the urine. Women, it's a little bit higher. Women generally have less intense spikes and a little bit higher of a baseline. But we get this big spike and then it drops hard. And what happens is it, during that spike, that growth hormone goes to the liver. The liver goes, oh my God, let's make IGF-1. It makes IGF-1, binds to IGF binding protein 3 and a few other binding proteins, and then circulates. So IGF-1 kind of does the, uh, the grunt work of growth hormone, okay? So in a healthy human, the, the natural rhythm of growth hormone release is about every three hours, give or take maybe 30, 45 minutes. And that is mediated through somatostatin. So somatostatin basically binds to its receptor, puts the block on it, and then it comes off and it allows growth hormone to be released. Now, the other really important thing is that growth hormone is going to be made in the pituitary gland. And so this, the somatostatin blocking is really important because what it does is you put the brakes on, you allow the cells to make more growth hormone, so it kind of builds up, builds up, builds up, break comes off, boom, pulse, okay? That's why that's important. However, when you're using the growth hormone secretagogue peptides, somatostatin's your worst enemy. Because if you come in here with a growth hormone releasing hormone, such as the uh, mod GRF, tesamorelin, or sermorelin, which Sermorelin is actually an FDA approved drug, and so you might know about that one. But if you just come in with this one, what will happen is it will stimulate the growth hormone releasing hormone receptor, which will then increase cyclic AMP and try to push out some growth hormone. If somatostatin is blocking growth hormone release at that time, somatostatin kind of wins, okay? You'll get a little bit of spike in growth hormone when you, when you force it through the growth hormone releasing hormone receptor, but somatostatin's kind of just like, hey, no, no, I'm here, you're not getting out, okay? However, on this side, our growth hormone releasing peptides, they do something really cool. 
they bump somatostatin off of its receptor. And so theoretical, if you could time it perfectly and you knew exactly when somatostatin was not on your pituitary receptors, you could just take a growth hormone releasing hormone, these ones up over here, and you would never need to use a GHRP. Good luck guessing the timing of that though, right? And so we pair these to the GHRP and the GHRHs because it basically forces that somatostatin off so that way you actually get a pulsatile release in growth hormone that is much, much greater than using either of these alone, okay? Here is, uh, let me actually show you this study first. This is basically what I'm talking about here, okay? So our, in our blue, so this, the uh, orange is just a, a placebo. I don't remember what they used from, I think it was just saline to be honest. Okay, so here's growth hormone release. This was a human study. So they gave intravenous bolus, right? Nothing happened with just saline, okay? They give the growth hormone, the GHRP, and look at, you got a little bump there, okay? You give uh, a GHRP higher dose, okay? Here's our green, right? So this was 0.1 micrograms per kilo. This here was one microgram per kilo. And here's our GHRH, right? So we just get a little bit bump like that, right? So remember our GH is on this, GHRH is on this side, GHRP on this side. So if you were to just take one of them, you'd want to take the GHRP, right? Because at the same dosage, you're gonna get this versus this. But look what happens when you do them together. That's almost a threefold difference in growth hormone release. Again, because that GHRP is kicking off the somatostatin, which is allowing that GHRH to really help ramp up release of, of growth hormone. This is a study, uh, again, in humans. Actually, it's the same study as this, human study. This here, they were looking at basically what dosage do we need to use of the GHRP to get maximal effects. Um, I wish they went a little higher than this. I would have loved to see two micrograms per kilo, um, but at one microgram per kilo, which for the average person is gonna be anywhere between you know, 70 to 100 micrograms, you're getting a much, much bigger uh, increase in, in growth hormone. And so that will impact how we dose it. So here are two GHRHs, CJC1295 with drug affinity complex. That is sermorelin. Drug affinity complex is basically this molecule that they attach to the GHRH, which allows it to stay in the blood longer, okay? After everything I just said with how we want this quick action pulsatile release, does it kind of seem dumb to make the GHRH just kind of stick around in the blood for a really long time, just kind of pushing against the growth hormone uh, cells in the pituitary gland, okay? That's why Sumerillin doesn't really work that well. However, the CJC1295 without the drug affinity complex, which is also called, mo called mod GRF, that one is in the blood for a really short amount of time. So it comes in, it boom, on that growth hormone receptor in the uh, pituitary gland, which then signals that whole cascade to start. In terms of our GHRPs, okay, there's four main ones that uh, most people in this space have used and experimented with, okay? The old ones are GHRP6 and GHRP2, and then we have hexarelin and ipamorelin, okay? Now, the older ones, they will have a stronger impact on cortisol and prolactin levels than the newer ones will, except for GHRP2, okay? That one was only mild to moderate. But the nice thing about some of these older ones, like GHRP2, you got a really big release in growth hormone, but it came at a detriment to, you actually had an increase in cortisol, prolactin, and TSH as well, okay? And so the newer one, which is what I use, ipamorelin, that one is what I call a cleaner peptide, okay? You don't get, man, if you really wanna know what hunger pains feel like, go take some GHRP2, it is super, super intense but you might actually want that, right? If you are using these peptides in patients who are underweight, you might actually want that because it's gonna trigger hunger so strongly 
that they're likely going to be eating more. Okay, so you can use that to your advantage. Um, but ipramelin is just a whole lot cleaner, and so you don't get uh, as strong of hunger pains, and you don't get large alterations in TSH, cortisol, and prolactin. Here are just, again, going through those four that I just talked about. First gen, second gen, and then the third gen is our hexarelin and ipamorelin. All right, the good stuff. How do I dose? So remember I told you that every three hours or so, somatostatin comes off and allows that growth hormone release, right? So what that tells me is that nature wants about three hours between each time that growth hormones release in order to build up your reserve of growth hormone in the growth hormone cells to then secrete, okay? So because of that, we can actually dose GHRP and GHRH multiple times throughout the day as long as we are respecting the three hour time frame, okay? So you don't want to inject and then an hour later inject and an hour later inject and there's your three doses for the day. You'd want to space them out by about three hours. The more doses you do throughout a day, the higher, uh, the more growth hormone pulses you're gonna have that are stronger, the stronger effects you're gonna get, okay? So our mild effect dosing, okay, which is basically just 100 micrograms, just because that makes it simple, 100 micrograms of both of those once a day. I generally tell patients is good for maintenance dosing and if you do it long-term, some anti-aging benefits, okay? The moderate effects, so when we do our BID dosing, that's where we start to see um, some uh, improved healing times around post-procedure and that kind of stuff. Going up into our strong max and then our super saiyan doses, those are uh, generally more reserved for bodybuilding world, okay? Where someone's not using growth hormone and, but they're wanting to try and uh, maximize their, uh, the effects of growth hormone that's where these doses will start to come into play, okay? Because um, this one here, this is probably, through a compounding pharmacy, gonna cost you about two grand a month. So, super expensive, okay? Um, when you start getting into, right, so the, my preferred time to take it is at night, right before bed, okay? You always need to take it on an empty stomach, okay? If you have fat or carbohydrates, that blunts the effects of the growth hormone secreted gogs. And not a lot of people know that. You only know that if you were part of underground forums in the early 2000s. <laughs> but uh, there's research showing that you get a blunting effect of these peptides when you have carbohydrates or fats floating through your system. So my instructions to patients are two hours before no food and then 30 minutes after no food, okay? So preferred time is right before bed. 10% of patients will have some, uh, uh, some insomnia and it's a little bit harder to sleep. And so if that's the case, then I just move their preferred time to right in the morning when they wake up. If we're doing BID dosing, I'll do morning and night. Again, it's super easy. It's at least easier to do it morning and night than it is to try and plan it out through the day. And then once we get into three times a day dosing, I'll generally recommend that based on what the goals of the patient are to either do their dose right before a workout or right after a workout, okay? I'll do it right before a workout if they want to lose weight because you're going to do, take the growth hormone secretagogues, you're going to have increased lipolysis, so now you have more free fatty acids floating through the blood, and then you're going to go work out, and you're going to burn off more of those than you would if you didn't take the growth hormone secretagog. And then if they want to focus more on muscle building and mass, then I'll dose it after because that anabolic window after and then within 30 minutes after that, they then get to have their post-workout meal and we are compounding the nutrient status on the growth hormone and IGF-1 floating through the blood.